Good evening, everybody. Um, it's nothing like appearing in front of a hostile crowd. <laughs> um, you could have kept some of your applause for Maureen just out of uh, <laughs> politeness. Um, so I, I, I always think that really everybody can write a column. Uh, not too many people can write two columns. Um, and the numbers probably diminish after 200 or 2,000. Um, and uh, Maureen Dowd has been one of the English language, language's great columnists for probably longer than she quite cares to remember. But, <laughs> uh, but, but um, to sustain <coughs> a public voice while um, analyzing commenting on illuminating public events uh, through so many extraordinary periods of American history uh, is an astonishing achievement. Uh, those of us who, who sort of follow in her wake uh, are, uh, I think, have learned an enormous amount from, from Maureen about uh, the craft, you know, about that, that sort of primary function of a columnist, which is to try to get somebody to start reading the column uh, and to finish it, you know, to actually <laughs> to tell a story, to, to construct uh, a piece of serious analysis in a way that engages a reader. Um, and and Maureen Dad's done that so consistently with the quality of her insight, uh, with, with um, the sharpness of her perception, with that extraordinary reporter's ability to pick out the detail that illuminates and, and unlocks a larger story. Uh, with, uh, of course, with, with the lightness of touch um, that I think is, is crucial to sustaining a column, perhaps even all the more so in, in very difficult and serious times. Um, uh, you know, that humor, that wit. Um, and with that, I think, unique combination of sharpness um, that makes her feared and human warmth that makes her loved. Um, and I can't think of another columnist in the language who, who's sustained that kind of combination over such a period of time. Um, so it's, I've been a fan and a reader for, for so long. It's, it's just such a pleasure to meet Maureen. Uh, today and, and, and to be able to um, have a conversation with her uh, now over the next hour. Um, Maureen, can we maybe just start with the Irish-American worlds that you grew up in and, and the politics of that world? Because I, I was wondering from your perspective looking back, I mean, you grew up in you know, a world that I suppose most people here would sort of recognize spiritually, intellectually, politically in some ways, um, so much part of, of, of our own uh, experience. But it was also that sort of Irish Catholic world you grew up in, in America, was a very democratic world, wasn't it? I mean, in small, large D, I mean, it was, it was associated very much with the labor movement, with the Democratic <laughs> Party, uh, with the, the New Deal. Does it seem to you now that that world that you grew up in, that sort of psychological context, political culture, um, is gone? Mm. You know, I always tell people that um, my dad was so excited the night Harry Truman won that he stayed up all night to see what the vote was. And my brother, uh, was so excited the night Trump won, he stayed up all night to see what the vote was. And I always say, if the Democrats can't figure out what went wrong between those two nights, they're never gonna get the working class back. Um, and you're right, I mean, the world I grew up in was a very male-dominated world. You know, the church. Um, my dad was a police detective so the police and, um, you know, it was uh, a fantastic family to grow up in. Um, my parents were both extremely charismatic. My dad was born in Ballybon and my mom 
my mom's parents were from Ballinrobe. And um, they met in the Irish community in Washington. And um, they were, my dad uh, was a soccer player and a step dancer, and they were uh, expert dancers and danced the hornpipe. And, you know, it was a very warm, loving family. I had five siblings. I <laughs> have. I only have two left, one of whom is here, my sister Peggy. And um, yeah, so I was very lucky. You, you said that the Democrats would need to try to figure out why they lost the working class. I mean, from, from watching it over so many decades, I mean, was this something you were aware of yourself as time was going on, that, that people like your family were, were being alienated more and more from the democratic world. Yeah, well, basket of deplorables, <laughs> you know, I might say it in that phrase. Um, I noticed, you know, I, as uh, Fenton says, I've covered more campaigns and until the last couple in high yields than you would want to know. and. What I noticed is, it's funny, the Democrats did well when they had uh, these very, you know, candidates with Elan, like JFK and Bill Clinton, sort of very charismatic candidates. And they did not do well when they have what I would call school marm candidates, which would be Adlai Stevenson or uh, Michael Dukakis, John Kerry, Al Gore, Hillary Clinton, and for some reason, they lean into that type. And over the years, I think that many Democrats began to feel that the, the Democratic Party uh, was sort of radiating disdain. And uh, you saw that, you know, Obama had that comment once about they're just clinging to guns and religion, and Hillary had the basket of deplorables. And you, you know, you would just get a glimpse of that sometimes. I think James Carville called it, you know, uh, like academic faculty lounge politics mm -hmm. where they just seemed above it all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Obama didn't seem like that at first, but you saw that in the second debate with Romney where he began to radiate this prof professorial, I'm too good for you kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't think they do well when they have that type of candidate and they like that type of candidate, so. Mm -hmm. For you, I, 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 I imagine, I mean, just because I work as a newspaper columnist myself, that there may be two kinds of people who become columnists. One are people who are really interested in writing and then discover, oh, I could get paid for this <laughs> and this is a way of being a writer. And others who are, you know, really, really interested in, in reporting uh, and then kind of rise up through reporting and, 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 and become columnists. Um, did you start out as someone when you were a kid? Because I know you studied English as, as well in, in, in college. I mean, did you see your, think about yourself as a writer? Was that what you wanted to be first? Yeah, my family is shocked that I'm a columnist because being a columnist is really like being in The Godfather. You know, you take one of theirs, they take two of yours, you go to the mattresses. It is very rough. And, uh, you know, I was super shy as a kid, very introverted. So this is the last thing that my family ever thought I would be able to do. My dad loved newspapers, so I wish he had lived to see that. But, um, you know, it's sort of a yin-yang thing. I'm yin, and writing a column is yang. And it's, it's uh, not really that suited to my personality. So, uh, you know, when I first started, I just thought, I can't do this. It's too intense. And also, I don't really like telling people what to think or handing down opinions from above. And that's what columns were for a long time. And um, so, I, you know, my skin started to break out, my hair started to fall out, I was just curled up in a ball on the floor at night. 
And I went to, oh, you know, one night, this is funny, I, you know, I had stopped to get some Popeye's chicken and I had Clearasil smeared all over my face. <laughs> I walked by a mirror and I saw myself with a chicken leg and Clearasil and I just thought, this isn't how columnists for the New York <laughs> Times. I'm sure William Sapphire is not doing this tonight. So I went to my boss and I told him after six months, I just didn't think I was temperamentally suited. And he was like, fine, we'll send you out to the suburbs to you know, cover schools again or something. And I'm like, okay, I'll give it another shot. Because <laughs> I, had, I had done that for so many years and I didn't want to start all over again. But, um, you know, it comes really naturally to Tom Friedman you know, and um, really all the other columnists. And uh, in a way, it doesn't for me. So I was a political reporter for a long time. So what I really try and do is report it rather than, and uh, I get, you know, a lot of times um, people will get angry at me because they want it to be ideological and that isn't the kind of column. I write more of a psychological column. Um, I love Shakespeare, Fenton has a brilliant book on Shakespeare, and I try and do it more from that point of view because I'm just fascinated with how people spend their whole life trying to be president, and then for some crazy reason, just at the moment, they should feel they're affirmed and they should feel confident. They self-destruct, all of their gremlins come out, like we saw it with Nixon, we saw it with LBJ, we saw it with W. And to me, that's like watching a Shakespearean play. And, you know, I'm fascinated with power and how people use it and abuse it. And so it's, you know, it's a different thing. I'm not taking it from the left or the right. And, uh, you know, that always causes me problems on the left and the right. There's no safe, warm home I have to go to. So, uh, yeah. One of the things that fascinates me about your background as well is that you're Washington, yeah. But you're and you're in some ways inside it. You know, your family is close to you know working in the capital, close to the kind of political uh, nexus in some ways. But yet you're also outside it. You know, you're kind of working class people. You're not part of that kind of privileged Washington. Elites, I suppose we have to use that word, the beltway, all that stuff. But, but you, you, do, do you think that helped to form you in the, in, in the sense that you're not intimidated by the Washington universe? Yeah. Because you're familiar with it growing up, but at the same time you, you have that enough distance from it to be able to, to observe it with that kind of sharpness of, of the outsider. Yeah, the best advice I got about this was, you know, I, I'm always getting in these scrapes, and uh, I got in some scrape where people were really mad at me about something, and um, Russell Baker, who was an amazing columnist we had, uh, wrote me a letter, and he said, just remember, these are all the same guys you went to high school with. And uh, there were no guys in my high school. But I understood what he was saying. He was saying, you, you can't look at them as uh, demigods. You have to, you know, bring them down a peg because that's what you're there for if they do something that deserves it. Um, you know, and I'm not, uh, because of the kind of column I write, like, uh, usually, even if I start out kind of friendly with a, a presidential candidate or a politician, you know, something I write will make them mad. And then in the end, you know, I was thinking today, it's like, so W nicknamed me the Cobra, and uh, Obama told me I was really irritating, <laughs> and Trump tweeted that I was a neurotic dope, and Hillary called me a little Irish bitch. Yeah. <laughs> to which I, I responded, I'm not that little. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, if you put that together, it's lib. So, you know, but being liberated as well, maybe, or something. But, yeah. um, 
so yeah, yeah I mean, you, you mentioned this because because you you do report and therefore you 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 have to talk to people a lot. You have to keep open these lines of communication. And you, you know, I I this is a very intimate society in a way in Ireland. But I I don't I mean I I don't talk to Leo Varadkar or Michal Martin or you know I don't do that. So it's much more distant and it's easier in a way. But because of the nature of the, the way you write, you, 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 you need this relationship in some way to the people you write about. And I just wonder how you manage that because, because it doesn't make you in any way uh, less willing to skewer them. Yeah. Uh, but you know, how, how, I just wonder how, how it's on a simple working level. How do you maintain that kind of... Openness. Well, I can't really. You know, at some point, um, it, maybe it's better if I describe specifically. So, when Obama came along, I thought he was a really exciting candidate. I just thought, you know, he could solve all kinds of problems in America in terms of who he was, how he looked, how he talked, you know, he was just exciting and modern and uh, smart. And uh, so I went on the road with him for about a year. And, um, but again, you know, when he was campaigning the first time, he uh, went to primary states like Pennsylvania and he'd go to an Irish bar. And Obama was very, very fastidious. So they give him a beer and they give him, you know, some fries or something, and he would take one tiny sip because he was very conscious of his weight. And um, then he would take the fries and he'd hand them off to his body guy, Reggie Love. And um, so I just wrote a funny story about what it was like campaigning with him in working class bars where he was, you know, never, you know, tasting anything or. Uh, being very prim, and um, so then we were on this plane to Europe, and he asked to talk to me, and I thought he was going to give me some big scoop, and that's when he goes, you're really irritating. <laughs> <laughs> and then he repeated it. He said, you are just really irritating. And he goes, you are in charge of the zeitgeist, and I don't like the zeitgeist you're giving me. He said, um, I don't want to beat the Andive, Andive eating is it on dive? On eating, you know, um, fastidious, finicky candidate. I want to be the cool candidate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was like, I'm sorry, that's what I saw, or whatever. But it was funny because I did learn something because he, being the cool one, was really, really important to him. And that was kind of interesting to learn, even though he yelled at me. But my relationship with Biden is really weird because, you know, I knocked him out of the 88 campaign because I did the story where he took uh, stuff from Neil Kinnick's speeches. And people always call it plagiarism, but it wasn't quite that. It was like Biden gets so overly enthusiastic about things that he just fell in love with Kinnick's description of his life. So he actually sort of took his life. It wasn't so much the words. Like he said, he thought to himself, well, I played football in high school. And Kinnick said he played football, not realizing it was soccer. And then Kinnick said he had a coal mining family, and Biden thought, I'm from Pennsylvania, so that's sort of like coal mine, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he just took the guy's life. That was what was funny about it. And, um, but when I did it, it was sort of a light feature. It wasn't a censorious thing. But anyway, then there was, I, there was more, like he took Robert Kennedy's speeches and stuff, which I did write about too. And, and so then in the end, you know, um, he like was mad at me for a while, but then he had an aneurysm, so then he liked me again because he said if that had happened on the campaign trail, he would have died. So yeah. then he thought I saved his life. And then, <laughs> and then we were, you know, had a really good relationship when he was vice president. And he said to me once, you know, 
I told Barack that he shouldn't resist you. He should just give in because it could go badly if he didn't. And, uh, you know, he, but then when he, and he used to call me all the time and sort of test out whether he should run for president. But then when he got to be president, you know, or actually it was right before he got to be president. Um, you know, I wrote a story about how he should kind of get it together with his family. And it wasn't uh, all the stuff we now know about Hunter and that kind of thing. It was just very gentle. You know, this is getting a little messy. They should get it together. But then he, Biden got mad at me all over again. So now I have no access to him. So as you say, you know, and it's hard, because I see all the guys going to play golf with him, like the male columnists, or hanging out with him, or going to the White House. And I don't want the prestige of that, but I do love hearing what they have to say and seeing how their mind works. Like one time, um, I had, on the campaign trail, I'd given Obama a copy of Mad Men, you know, the show. and. Uh, he was sort of accusatory, he was a little accusatory, like, are you giving me this because they smoke on the show? And I said, no, uh, I just thought you'd like it. So we were at a lunch at the White House and um, Paul Krugman was next to me. He was so nervous, like he spilled his salad in his lap. <laughs> and Obama leaned around him to talk to me. He said, I just wanted to tell you, I really loved Mad Men. He said the Peggy Olson character, the young woman, and it reminded him of his grandmother because she was a banker, a woman in a man's world. And you know, it just, if you can actually talk to them, you kind of learn about them and you learn who has control over your life, over life and death, whether we go to war. So I just like to talk to them as much as possible and I like the readers to hear their voices more than my voice which most columnists do the reverse. But. Mm -hmm. You mentioned being a, a woman in a man's world, the Peggy Olsen uh, idea, but um, I mean, journalism, when you were going into it, I mean, it was, was still actually quite misogynistic, wasn't it? I mean, it was very much male-dominated, particularly political reporting, I would have thought. Um, and obviously, it's one of the constant themes of your writing as well. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you've had to explore so much. Would you just talk about that a little bit from, from the point of view of your own experience? I mean, did it, did it make it more difficult to do what you ended up doing? Well, yes, it was, uh, it was misogynistic. But in another way, you know, they want great stories and good writing. And if you can give them that, they don't care if you're a man or a woman because that's gonna make them look good. And uh, it is funny when you look back on it because the way I got to cover pre you know, presidential level politics was when Geraldine Ferraro got picked um, as uh, the vice presidential nominee, all the editors were like, a woman? you know, running for vice president, how are we gonna do this? So they decided, oh, well, we'll get a woman to do it. They thought it had to be matchy-matchy. Mm -hmm. So all the people on the Ferrar bus were women. Then Jesse Jackson started running, the editors were like, how are we gonna do this? I guess we'll have to get some black reporters. Mm -hmm. So all the reporters in Jesse Jackson were black reporters. and. It's, it was horrible in one way, but in another way, it was this huge opportunity for us. So, um, yeah, I remember when Sarah Palin got appointed and, and the editors are like, oh, yeah, we're gonna have to find a woman. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of crazy, but yeah. yeah. Um, the first president you would have covered would have been Reagan. Well, Reagan, I, I was just at the tail end of Reagan yeah. and, um, this is a funny story. So I, um, you know, the most amazing thing about the Reagan administration was that Nancy had this astrologer. And the astrologer, Joan Quigley, was the one who um, was literally deciding if we would uh, make peace with the Russians if Gorbachev and Reagan would meet and win. And she was checking the star charts 
would Reagan meet Gorbachev and where, what date and what hour of day. I mean, it's crazy to think about, but um, the funny thing is, so anyway, I decided I was gonna hire Jen Quigley to do my chart and my sister, Peggy's chart, who's here. And so, you know, she was quite expensive, but I wanted to see this woman who was in charge of our fate as a civilization. <laughs> uh, so she did the Peggy's chart. We told her what time of day and everything, the birth and everything. And it came back and the whole analysis was about Peggy's husband and three children which she doesn't have. And at that point, I got really scared. <laughs> uh, there was a, te a tendency when, when, when Trump was president to kind of look back with a certain kind of nostalgia and say, oh, you know, there was never anything like this before. And of course, in some ways, this was true. But um, you go back to something like the, the invasion of Iraq. You know, and and the sheer extent of the lying, and and you know the, the very very deliberate construction of a story for the public. Um, you know, when when you look back on that, and and I mean your experience of covering all these presidents, I mean, do do you think that there was a tendency to perhaps overstate the extent to which Trump came from nowhere? Well, you know, I covered, I've covered Trump, I covered these dynasties, all of them, for mm. 30 years. And Trump, you know, when I covered him, uh, you'd go to a Trump hotel in New York and the water would have his face on it. <laughs> his face would be in the bathroom, anywhere you looked, you saw Trump's face. And, you would just roll your eyes. He was like a cartoon character out of a Batman movie or something, but he wasn't someone that we ever thought would be president. I mean, I went on his first uh, foray, uh, campaign foray in um, uh, 99, and Roger Stone set it up, and we went, he went to talk to um, anti-Castro Cubans in Miami, and Melania, and Trump and I went, and Melania had been outfitted with a special Calvin Klein wardrobe that was meant to make her look like a campaign wife rather than her usual four-inch stiletto, you know, heels and stuff. And uh, Trump, we got to Miami and Trump looked at the Trump 2000 signs and he sort of shrunk away. He was you know, he was, the whole idea intimidated him as well. And, uh, you know, I think it was, it just seemed impossible that someone like Trump would be president. When I interviewed him, he loved to do, he always wanted to do lightning rounds. So um, you just, like, give him quick, like, what do you think of so-and-so? Like, I'd say, what do you think of Hillary? He loved Hillary. Uh, what do you think of Monica Lewinsky? You know, she got a raw deal. She should, you know, have better treatment or something. Uh, what do you think of Bill? I can't believe he can't get into this Westchester golf club. You know, he wanted to talk about movie stars, give his opinion of all the movie stars. So this was a typical Trump thing. So. For some reason, I was asking about Halle Berry, and he goes, okay, Halle Berry, I would say her face is a 10, her body is an eight, and her legs are a five. I mean, that's how he talked. And, you know, uh, in a million, oh, he would like, when Twitter first came along, he would tweet things about the love life, the breakup of the Twilight Stars. You know, he would be offering Robert Pattinson advice on Twitter. I mean, he just wasn't, he was someone like a, a New York cartoon character. He wasn't someone any of us ever thought about in terms of being president. And um, then when he got to be president, you know, one of my colleagues said it's gonna be like federal daycare. <laughs> and then the other day when we learned he threw his plate and ketchup against the wall, federal daycare. 
Um, but you're right in the sense that I know I'm, I would say I'm almost alone in this opinion, but to me, Dick Cheney was always scarier than mm. Trump because Trump, uh, you know, when he wants to do something wrong, he does it right out in the open and everyone knows, so you have time to organize and stop him, in essence. You know, with Cheney, he was, um, he had that very deep voice, headmaster, school voice, and he um, had a lot of sources in Washington and a lot of male reporters really loved him. And so it never occurred to them that he was doing something really, really wrong, you know, because they thought it's Dick Cheney. And he knew how to pull the levers of power in a way that Trump didn't, where it took several years for people to realize that the Iraq war was you know, this complete sort of invention that Dick Cheney had maneuvered and pushed. And, you know, that kind of thing terrified me. That's like a movie where you realize the chief of staff is the villain in the second half of the movie. I mean, with Trump, there's sort of a buffoonish element where he does, you know, he was a president who tried to have a coup of the government he was running. You know, you say it out loud, and it, you know, it just sounds insane. But, uh, but he, he did things in a way, you know, but in another way, like, another way you're right is, you know, the Republicans for a long time have done racist things in campaigns, but they had a middleman, like Lee Atwater would do it for Bush Sr., you know, the Willie Horton thing. Their, their fingerprints wouldn't be on it. But Trump sort of cut out the middleman. He would do and say all the things that Republicans had traditionally done, but he wasn't, he was doing it himself. So yeah, you're right. But one of the things, one of the many things you were extremely prescient about is, is not just the specific things about specific candidates, but the way you, for a long, long time, you, you've always written about, <clears throat> in a way, the relationship between popular culture and politics. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that might have seemed almost odd to be doing that, say, in the 1980s. Yeah. But I, I wonder, does it strike you how, you know, that, those two worlds, the interpenetration of them has become so absolute? Yeah, this was so funny. So I kind of pioneered uh, this idea that I would ask presidential candidates um, what movies they saw. Did they go to the opera or ballet? Or what was their favorite TV show, their favorite actress? And at the time, you know, that was not done. So Michael Dukakis would be like, let's get back to policy. And when I asked Bush Sr., he would be, don't put me on the couch. And when I asked W what his favorite cultural experience was, he said baseball. Like, but to me, that was a good way to get them off their speech talking points. And you could see more what they were like. But as you say, now that's the first story that, and the guys really made fun of me. Like all the male reporters said that was so trivial and this is why we shouldn't have women reporters. And now it's the first thing they do with presidential candidates. I can't do it anymore because everybody gets to it too fast. It's mm -hmm. literally the first interview they do. So I'm getting my master's at Columbia in English literature. So I tried to move from the intersection of politics and culture to um, the intersection of academia and politics. Mm -hmm. But um, this is another thing where we don't realize this has already happened. So Joe Kennedy, when he wanted to create his dynasty, he went about it like a movie producer, which he was, you know, a movie producer. So, um, you know, it was gonna be all white teeth and great hair and Newport, and he was so thrilled about Jackie Bouvier being uh, Jack's fiance because she looked like a movie star and had class, and that's what he wanted. So he produced his dynasty like a movie producer. So 
that happened even before we got Reagan. And, you know, you see it with Zelensky. I mean, Zelensky had um, a TV show where he played a president. Trump had a TV show where he played a good chief executive, <laughs> which he wasn't, you know. And so people, voters kind of fuse that in their head and they think, you know, these guys are. Like in Zelensky's case, he's risen to the occasion, but in Trump's case, like he's one of the worst managers, you know, any of us have ever seen. So, but in in their heads, the voters thought, yeah, he's this calm, cool, collected guy on The Apprentice. You mentioned Shakespeare earlier, and I, I wonder, do you think it's over the top or exaggerated to use the word tragic about the Clintons? That if you think about, you know, both of them in different ways, I mean, having so much intelligence, I mean, so much talent, in Bill's case, just an incredible natural politician, um, <clears throat> and yet, you know, un unable somehow to sustain the use of power without being brought down by the flaws they had themselves. Yeah, I mean, I know the Clintons, you know, are beloved in Ireland for what they did for Ireland, and I think that was great, too. My mom switched her vote from Pat Buchanan to Bill Clinton to thank him for what he did in Ireland, and, um, but as you say, to me, I'm, I'm just always amazed at how people, you know, self-destruct, and, uh, the Clintons, you know, this is one of my favorite factoids about politics. Two Democrats got connected <laughs> to the Clintons. Two Democrats got elected president, but didn't get to serve, or got the popular vote, but didn't get to serve because they didn't listen to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton tried to tell Al Gore, let me campaign for you in the South you know, uh, let me go to Arkansas and Tennessee and stuff, and Gore was very offended by Clinton's behavior with Monica, so he wouldn't let him campaign. You know, he wouldn't take any advice from him, and that one state was the difference of Gore not getting to be president. With Hillary, you know, he tried to tell her that there was something really wrong with the rural white male vote, which he is the world's living expert on. He said, mm -hmm. something's really wrong. This is a year out. Let me go out. I will go out and figure this out and campaign. And uh, Hillary had a 35-year-old campaign manager named Robbie Mook, who thought because of Obama's campaign that we were past the point of human kind of instinct and in politics, and it was all about big data. And he thought, you know, they, he had analyzed all the data and it was very modern and <clears throat> they didn't need Bill. And he literally would go to reporters and imitate Bill's accent. And he would imitate Bill saying, there's something wrong with the rural white vote. I should go out and see what it is. He would make fun of Bill to reporters. And what he didn't understand was he had all these big data models, but they were based on Obama. And Hillary and Obama are very different. They weren't going to get exactly the same vote, you know? So they blew off Bill's advice on that. And in Hillary's case, you know, I think there's one very interesting tidbit in Amy Chosick's uh, campaign book on Hillary where it, it has a whole long list of about 100 slogans they were thinking of for the campaign. And one of them was, it's her turn. And to me, that really sums up what was wrong with her campaign. You know, it, it felt like she was just tapping her toe, like waiting, like I'm owed this, look at what I've gone through with Bill. You know, look at what I went through when Obama leapfrogged over me. You know, it's me. So she didn't, like when Bill campaigned, if there was an all-night bowling center, he would be there. He would stay up all night campaigning. You just felt the hunger. But with Hillary, she was kind of holed up in a Beverly Hills hotel room with Huma Abedin and 
you know, campaigning, she, again, it was sort of, she was disdainful of campaigning. She just thought it was her turn. And voters don't respond to that. They just, they, you know, they want you to woo them and tell them what you're gonna do for them. I wanna let the audience, I'm sure they've got lots of questions, but I'll ask you the big one. Um, how worried are you about the future of American democracy right now? I mean, where you've got a two-party system in which one of the parties no longer seems really to even be too interested in paying lip service to basic democratic values, like not having a coup. Um, you know, it, 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 having watched all the developments of American democracy and all the dramas and all the you know extraordinary moments uh, that, that have happened, are we at a at a point of potential no return now? Um, I used to be optimistic about this. I mean, there was a time six or seven years ago when I would fix up my Republican nephews with Democratic young ladies. I fixed up my nephew with Jen Psaki, if you guys have seen her on TV. I thought it'd be great to have that redhead in the family. But um, I wouldn't do that anymore. I mean, I, I just feel like we've passed some point where I just don't know how we're all gonna get back together again. I. Um, took my brother to Monument Valley, where John Wayne made all his movies for his birthday. And um, he, you know, we were driving around, and he's a conservative. And uh, we went back to the room, and we, and I was trying, I was thinking as we were driving around John Wayne land, OK, our identity as a country based on John Wayne is coming to an end, although you still see the frontier myth mentality and the gun debate. But I was thinking, OK, that's coming to an end. So what are we evolving into as we are going to become a minority majority country? Or what, what is our next identity? And I used to think, well, it'll be something you know, good. And, um, but I'm not sure anymore. I just feel like we're in this crazy, not only identity crisis, but existential crisis. And, you know, we're like, it's like our brains are rotting from reality TV and Kardashians and, you know, I, I'm just, for the first time, not feeling very hopeful. Um, not because, you know, I mean, the thing we've been through with Trump and Republicans who don't acknowledge what we've been through is really awful, but, you know, it just seems that the Civil War started again, that instead of being over all those years ago, it was just put on pause. And uh, I just can't see the, how the two sides, they're so far apart and they're not listening. You know, I interviewed Una Mullally for my Sunday column coming up about abortion, and she said that the reason you know, after the law, after the Eighth uh, Amendment was repealed, that, you know, there wasn't the, all this fractious argument was because of how they argued with each other in a very mature, civil way. <clears throat> and so there were no hard feelings afterwards. And I just feel like we've lost our ability to do that as Americans. Uh, we've just got time for <clears throat> one or two questions. Um, so if anybody would like to go first. Yes, please. Uh, just there. Uh, thank you. I'm loud, but I'm not quite that loud. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm visiting from the great commonwealth of Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And you know, one of the things I've seen over time was my moderate Republican friends, we have a Republican governor, I voted for him, I like him. And it seems like the moderate Republican group or population has just disappeared. You're either way left or you're way right and there seems no middle ground do you see a politician anywhere coming up 
who could conceivably bridge that divide, who's a conservative enough Democrat to get the conservative Republicans to switch gears. Because I think what happened in the last elections was a lot of moderate Republicans, Rockefeller Republicans, as they refer to themselves, simply sat out the election. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think Romney is trying to be that a little, but um, we also had a magazine cover recently or moderate Democrats and extinct species. And, uh, you know, I think they are extinct species. And the, the person who seems to have the best chance if Trump doesn't run or against Trump is Ron DeSantis. And as my sister says, he, they think of him as Trump without the baggage, but his conservative views are very, very similar. So it's not like Trump and this crazy religious radical Supreme Court has given people a taste to kind of go back to the middle. Um, I don't see it. Thank you very much. Can we take another question? Uh, yes, there's a, I'm sorry, my, the light is not great. So yeah, there's somebody at the back there, I think. Um, if uh, Donald Trump were in office today, would Putin have achieved one of his goals of a divided Europe, both within and between member states and beyond, and the United States on the other hand? And if so, what would the implications of that be? Great question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, you know, I often say that in it's hard to believe, but in some ways we were lucky with Trump because if Trump had been a drinker or a drug user or if he liked war rather than just the trappings of war, he doesn't like war. He thinks it's a waste of time. He thinks business you know, should take precedence. A lot of people don't realize this. When I wrote a long time ago that he was more of a dove than Hillary, who was a former Goldwater girl and a genuine hawk um, who liked to invade places. Uh, nobody believed me, but it's true. We're just very, very lucky that Trump, he likes, you know, he went to a military school, he likes military parades, all that stuff, but he does not like war itself. So in that sense, we're very lucky with him, but you know, for a long time, our reporters tried to figure out what does Putin have on Trump? You know, is there a tape? Is there, you know, some kind of blackmail involving women or whatever? But they never did figure it out. I mean, I think Putin reminds him of his father, who was a very stern guy who divided the world into uh, winners and zeros. And uh, you know that's the, what you see the uh, struggle of Trump now, because he doesn't want to be a loser in his father's eyes. You know, he had one picture on his desk, his father. And you know, he did, as you say, he was seemed to be willing to give Putin anything. You know, it was a very, very bizarre situation. Uh, we can take one more question. Uh, yes, I think we're at the back again. All the questions seem to be coming from the back. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Just, would you mind saying a little bit more about the the pattern you mentioned about the the gremlins coming out and these powerful people just as they reach that point of ambition? It must have been an extraordinary thing to witness over and over. Yeah, I have a, a friend who worked in the White House, and she said it is like being in a submarine. Like you can't, you somehow can't see what's obvious to everyone around you and it, it creates its own kind of weather and atmosphere. But um, I would say, you know, for me, I noticed it uh, most, or first, I think, with W. And he, um, he got to be president and then you know, his father wanted him to have these regents, like he was uh, a young king, you know, who needed to be groomed. So uh, 
he told Tim to hire Colin Powell and Dick Cheney, and Dick Cheney brought in Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, I think if W I had chosen people, you know, more his own age, who this is, again, it's sort of like people are always talking about government experience. But in the case of Rumsfeld and Cheney, they had more government experience than anyone, but that experience had made them think that they needed to do extreme things to protect presidential authority. And it, you know, they went through Watergate, and they wanted to get back all this authority in the presidency. They wanted, uh, Cheney wanted America to be a hyperpower where we would preemptively attack people who might attack us. It was, you know, really crazy. And W. I think just was very insecure because he knew that he had been uh, kind of a screw up until age 40 and a drinker. And then at age 40, he got serious. But then it wasn't that much later that he became president. And I just think he was very insecure and he let Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld run away with his presidency. And, you know, his father, I didn't get to tell you guys this, but his father uh, and I had uh, correspondence for 30 years. His father, um, it was kind of like one of those old 30s movies where, you know, it's a waspy, rich guy like Jimmy Stewart, and then a, a blue collar working girl like Jean Arthur, and, you know, it's two different worlds. He, he was sort of fascinated with me because I wasn't. You know, he said to me once. You know, he said to me once. His poster said, "We see you more at a paper like the New York Daily News," and I'm like, "Why? Because I'm ethnic." <laughs> and the poster said, "Yes. You know, we see someone different for the New York Times." Mm -hmm. But uh, Bush Senior was gr very gracious to me, and he was sort of fascinated with this. He called it this love-hate relationship we had, and. He, um, he said he would go to a shrink about it, kidding, because, you know, the Bushes were not introspective in any way. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he wrote me all these letters. He wrote me these hilarious letters like, I like you, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> Con effecto. You know, but the point I was going to make is a lot of these letters were, you know, he, he said, don't tell my son, you know, because he knew that I was writing critically about Cheney and the Sun in the Iraq War. And, you know, I realized he and Barbara, and then I later confirmed it, had the same opinion I did. They thought Cheney had just gone crazy and had run away with their son's presidency. And he, he but they were wasps, and he could never quite, he would try and sneak up on it and talk to his son, but he could never quite do it. He tried to do it through surrogates like Brent Scowcroft writing a Wall Street Journal piece. And um, so in this weird way, covering the Bushes was like this cross between Jeeves and Freud. Because you were watching this Oedipal thing where W was trying to outdo his father by going into Baghdad when he hadn't gone into Baghdad, and by getting a second term and pretending he was the heir of Ronald Reagan. He was the true conservative. And at one point he said, I wouldn't cut and run in Iraq. And we were all like, cut and run? You mean like your father did? You're saying your own father cut and ran? And you know, it was this crazy Oedipal loop-de-loop -loop that we were watching. And they kept saying they loved each other, and that's true, they did. But that was a crazy, crazy situation. I mean, to me, basically, we went into this fake war because of Cheney, but also because W was in this crazy contest with his father. He had never matched his father. Like, his father would, was a Yale captain of the baseball team, and W was the stickball <laughs> team. You know, it was always like the father was a World War II fighter pilot hero, and the son was in the National Guard, but usually didn't show up. So with the rock, he sort of, I think Cheney and Rumsfeld told him he could 
outdo his father. And so, you know, you're watching, it's, it's a crazy thing to watch because you're thinking, these people have control over our lives and we're watching these family dramas play out. I mean, it was also true of the Clintons. They had, obviously, you guys know, marital issues and, you know, uh, Bill would try and make up for his shortcomings by giving Hillary health care, which was 8% of the entire government. And then she didn't want Bill's advice on how to get health care through because he was misbehaving. So then she screwed up health care and it didn't pass at that time. So a lot, you know, I think if the public actually knew how much of policy was being affected by these family internecine dramas, they would be dumbfounded. Well, one might say they wouldn't be dumbfounded if they read Maureen Dowd, <laughs> because uh, that's, of course, what's unique about Maureen's work is, is that ability to write about politics uh, as drama, as, 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 as a human activity, uh, with, with all of the wonder of that sometimes, but also all the horror of the things that human beings get up to, the limitations uh, they have the psychological quirks, the, the, the relationships. Um, and I think that's why we all read you with, with such fascination um, and, and, and will continue to do so. Um, isn't it lovely sometimes to find a someone um, who has such eloquence and insight and wit uh, in print um, also has it in person? And uh, how, how beautiful it's been to you.